Now, as many of you know, I spend more than four decades working in cancer epidemiology and toxicology, and industry and media attention has focused a lot on cancer uh, when it comes to wireless radiation ever since a lawsuit was filed in 1993. But the NTP study, of course, which we will hear about again today, brings attention again to cancer. But my presentation this morning is going to focus on what I think is a far more important, more profound, and frankly, better established effect of wireless radiation. And that is its impact on reproduction and development and neurological markers. And I'm, I'm really grateful that Peter's here because, frankly, we need to work with industry to come up with safer ways and I, I want to hear later from you about what they, whether they listened to you or not. Because I've talked to other colleagues in industry who had really good ideas for hardware and software changes, uh, which were not implemented, shall we say. So let's, my talk today is going to talk uh, first about the details of what we know about exposure. When we talk about wireless radiation, it's not one thing, as I'm going to show you in a moment. There's frequency, which is how fast things move. There's power, which is how powerful it is in terms of the signal. There's the modulation of the signal. There's information content. And then there's this very important question. How do you measure it? What's the standard for measuring this? You will be shocked to learn there is not a uniform, universal, agreed upon metric for measuring it. And as a consequence, you will find people reporting average measures over 24 hours or one hour, when in fact it is the peak and it's the change that we have to focus on. I'm going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about biomarkers of risk. You'll hear more today uh, about sperm and how important sperm can be because uh, unlike other parts of the human body, it re reproduces very quickly, so it's an opportunity for study. But it also is something that is signaling some very important things as a biomarker of risk. I'm going to show you some of what we know about child and adult exposure introducing briefly some of the work of Claudio Fernandez, with whom we are honored to be working in, from the Federal University uh, in Brazil with his colleague Alvaro de Salas as well. And then I will click, quickly review a few of the thousands of studies that have been done on these things and on pregnancy. Pregnancy chiefly in animals, but some in humans, showing effects of prenatal exposure, such as we heard last night from Fiorella, as well as from Linda Birnbaum's presentation, showing effects of prenatal exposure on outcome. And I would submit to you that in the public discussion focusing on cancer, we are missing the boat. This is not about cancer. This is about what information we have now of subtle effects that may be population-wide, including the possibility, the possibility that one of the factors that could account for the unexplained epidemic of autism could be this exposure. And there's growing evidence for that of serious researchers, which we will be exploring later on today in the basic science group. Finally, I'll leave you with a few wildlife implications that have been raised. Now, this scenario, would, and all of these slides are, are available to you on the conference website, and we will make that available to you as well. It's a password-protected website, but this just shows you a way to illustrate what I just talked about. You have frequency. Uh, the cell phone goes from 900 million cycles a second to 2.4 billion cycles a second. You have amplitude, you have pulse, modulation, and all of these things characterize wireless radiation. Some studies, like those of you who are doing medical applications for the brain, are using continuous waves. Some are using pulsed, and there's a big difference in the biological effect. We are seeing many beneficial applications of RF, sometimes with continuous waves, and yet harmful effects with pulsed at levels that are too weak, too weak to otherwise have a biological effect. So that the biological effect coming, is coming more from the pulse, irregular pulse at a very, very weak rate over thousands of seconds and uh, over a lifetime. Now just to give you an idea of the fluctuation here, this is a four second phone call. And in four seconds, the phone goes in terms of power density, this is zero, Volts per uh, uh, meter, uh, and the, the electric field will go from very, very low, it rings. The worst time to put a phone next to your head is when you answer it. It goes to maximum power because it's smart. And when it's at maximum power, right, then it's working hardest. You can go down, up, down, up. And the whole thing, of course, homeostasis, the human body likes stability, predictability. 
This is four seconds on one phone call. Now, <clears throat> the standard anthropomorphic mannequin consists of a large empty plastic mold into which liquids of different specific density and gravity are poured to estimate the impact of different frequencies. It's all uniform. The brain is not uniform. You will see today, this is the way we measure cell phone impact. This has not changed, not changed in 20 years. These are the safety standards for every one of the world's cell phones and wireless devices today, based on this. We think it's time to change it, and so does the American Academy of Pediatrics. And we are going to show you some brilliant work from the ITIS, uh, the Swiss, I, I, I call you guys, Ezra, the Swiss National Institute of Technology, because there really isn't a comp, uh, something like you, but you really work for the government and with industry, and certainly with clinicians now to develop new technologies, but also to try to make them as safe as possible and model them. Now this is showing you, and this is from Claudio's work with us, a paper that was published on specific absorption rate in the head of tablet users, written by Juliana Borges Ferreira and Alvaro uh, uh, de Salas. Um, they created a realistic, anatomically accurate model of a child from an MRI. And they show this great absorption, just looking at the tablet here, into the eyes, right, into the frontal lobe. And Iris later, Dr. Udison, is going to tell us why she thinks that a glioblastoma in certain areas of the brain should be considered as a sentinel marker to suggest a cell phone exposure or wireless radiation, which is, I think, a very important thing for us to consider. And I'm delighted that she's here to talk with us about her work with cases of real people because we tend to be working experimentally. Now, this is the, um, the research. We, whenever we talk about what's happening with children, we see um, these um, remarkable uses, and I'm passing this around again. This is a plastic teething rattle case, teething, because that's what babies do with things, for an iPhone, okay? You can share it. You won't, this is a real thing. Pass it over uh, to the back. I think some people in the back didn't get it. And meanwhile, <coughs> I showed this last night, but a few of you were not here, and I will just take 30 seconds to run this. That's um, an iBouncy chair, and it's advertised uh, that you can protect your iPad. You protect your iPad so that they won't get damaged by the baby. Right? And the baby can be entertained for hours. This is a three-month-old. Some of them are a little older, right? Now, the National Toxicology Program did release last year animal studies, which, as you know, are the foundation for clinical trials. We don't debate when we have animal results for clinical trials. We start to develop drugs, and we test them in people. So every known agent that causes cancer in humans causes it in animals when adequately studied. That's a very important fact to consider. And Dr. Melnick who was one of the architects of the National Toxicology Program study, will be here today to talk to us about this in more detail. But I think bef before leaving the National Toxicology Program, I would be remiss not to be clear that the cumulative exposure in this study, the cumulative exposure in this study that was engineered by the engineers from Switzerland to mimic the cell phone radiation, is 36 years of exposure at a rate of 30 minutes per day. So this was engineered to mimic human exposure over a lifetime at a level that did not produce heat, that did produce biological effects, much to the surprise, I should say, of all of the investigators. I think that's fair to say. Now, the greatest exposure comes at the end of pregnancy to the fetus. And this has been modeled, again, from work done from the Swiss Institute. This is the nine-month-old, and again, you see the spinal cord, and you see the head getting the highest levels of radiation. And if you see in hospitals, young technicians who are pregnant often wearing their devices right in smocks right over the abdomen. And that is, I, I, you know, in medical systems, we've really got to rethink safety for our professionals as well. Now, this is a mobile phone in the pocket, something maybe a few of you know about. 
And um, recently, Consumer Reports in the United States advised that nobody keep a phone in their pocket. And this is just a little simulation here of the radiation um, as it's moving. And one of the things we know is that the dielectric constant of the penis and the testes is rather high because they're full of fluid. More fluid in, an, in a part of the body, the higher its absorption will be. And uh, this is just a simple illustration of the dose to the gonads and the bone marrow. And that is why, in fact, this is one of the secrets of cell phones. They are always tested in a holster. They are never tested in the pocket. Because if they were tested in the pocket, they would not meet the current safety standards. And that is why um, <clears throat> there is information in all phones today to tell you how to use them safely or as safe as they were tested. And um, how many of you know where to find the safety information inside your phones? How many of you know where to find it? Just how many? One, a, a few of you. How many do you not know? All right. We will show you at the coffee break what, how to find it because it's amazing that it's there. Now, in terms of mechanisms of action, people are always asking, what is explaining what, what is going on here? How could this possibly happen? And in the basic science group, I think we're going to go into more detail about this, but the, one of the theories that is gaining more and more currency is that oxidative stress is involved, that you basically get an effect, you get re reactive oxygen species. This is a production of things that will produce free radicals that can, in fact, disrupt membranes and, in fact, have an impact on apoptosis and sperm. And we can see clear evidence of effect on human sperm, I'll get to in a moment. Or you can have effects on the, um, the process. So you can have structural effects that damage the structure or functional effects. Structural or functional effects. And the functional effects have to do with stress kinases and uh, other things that are involved in repair or damage, heat shock proteins, for example. The bottom line is that with respect to reproductive endpoints, which I'm going to focus on here, the effect can be quite substantial, leading all the way to infertility. Now, um, what, we ha what we know about radio frequency radiation, and this is a slide developed by the team from the Cleveland Clinic under the leadership of Ashok Agarwal, who um, is an MD, PhD, leading their work for on, on infertility. They, they have demonstrated all of these endpoints associated with those who are the heavier uh, users. And the brain, of them, course, is the most important component of the hypothalamo-pituitary gonadal axis. For males and females, the brain is the most important part <coughs> of the reproductive system, although males sometimes do not appreciate that. Um, this slide now shows you something rather interesting. Thanks, Iris. Um, which is that semen analysis has been conducted in four different cell phone groups. And this was again produced from the Cleveland Clinic. Looking at these groups in terms of their reported use and then looking at sperm count, motility, viability, and morphology. And you can see here that those with the heaviest exposures, you see here in the blue, purple, or red, the heaviest exposures, more than four hours a day, have the most uh, damage uh, to their sperm. Uh, now, this is work done in, in Australia from their National Center on um, Male Reproductive Health, and they have shown that radiofrequency radiation, this is now an average of, of, of their um, report, um, has an effect so that the sperm count is lower and the damage to mitochondrial DNA is higher. Right. And I show you these as illustrative examples, and H Haggai is going to go into a bit more detail. There have now been many meta-analyses that conclude that there is no question that cell phone radiation damages sperm, human sperm, and there's experimental evidence to back this up. And that is why the, na the national discussion in many countries has not focused on sperm damage. And I think the reasons for that may be quite obvious. In many cultures, it's not something that one discusses. But the reality is that if you look at spermatozoa suspended in a Petri dish from humans and you expose them, you get these effects and they're quite robust and they're, and they're replicated. Um, this is at, a, at the level of uh, immunopositivity in the spermatocytic cells. You see that here is the controls. They're not particularly disrupted. And then here is evidence of damage when there's exposure, um, and this, these were done in animals. This is not experimental in the sense of the Petri dish or the test tube. 
This was done in whole animals. Oxidative DNA damage, 8-hydroxyguanine, and testicular biopsy scores, again, showing damage from levels of cell phone radiation. And there's more and more showing up with effects on glutathione peroxidase and catalase and important enzymes that have been identified for which there's no debate. Now, experimental studies of wireless radiation and pregnancy in rats and rabbits have been conducted in a number of, of laboratories in Turkey. And I am personally very sorry that our Turkish colleagues cannot be here today. They were planning to be here, and situations in Turkey are not permitting them uh, to travel. But the NATO, <coughs> pardon me, the NATO supported laboratory <coughs> of Professor Nezrin Sahan continues to produce um, peer reviewed publications that rely on simulated exposures uh, to phones. And I'm going to show you just a few of them. This is one where <coughs> she looked at uh, malonaldehyde, which is a measure of lipid peroxidation and an indicator of damage. And here are your controls, because you're going to see some damage. It's part of life is to have damage. And here are the exposed groups under 1,800 GSM conditions. And again, controls and exposed. There's more than twice as much damage in the exposed. Can I have some water? Now, <coughs> Mobile phones have also been shown to affect uterine development. And again, this is experimental work looking in, in studies in whole animals, looking at measures in the offspring, and showing <coughs> that under 900, 1800, and 2.4 or 2450 megahertz during pregnancy, at just 60 minutes a day of exposure for five times a week, there are, um, there are effects on pro progesterone levels. And progesterone is one of the hormones that's quite critical for healthy development uh, in animals. And they showed uh, very serious effects, again, with uh, greater exposures, exposures. And this is a study done in fruit flies. Fruit flies have the advantage, like sperm, that they are all multiply very nicely. And um, they provide very elegant animals. And if you can work on an electron microscope and know how to handle them without killing them, you're a very good scientist and better than I. I kept pulling the wings off when I was trying. But the reality is that six minutes a day of exposure, the lowest exposure, this is very interesting, causes as much apoptosis, which is cell deaths, as 60 minutes per day for six days. Now, that's very interesting because it does suggest that we can get adaptation and repair, but it also suggests that low levels of exposure can affect certain groups. And here you see that the effect of, of 60 minutes daily for six days, and six minutes daily for six days, and six minutes only on the sixth day. And we all talk about windows of vulnerability and timing of exposure, and how response depends upon underlying nutrition, et cetera. But this is suggesting that there are really important windows of vulnerability that need to be identified so that we can protect development in ourselves as well. Now, Yale University is one of the more recent places to have done studies on mice exposed in utero, where they took mice under established protocols and they exposed them to cell phone radiation. And what they found, these are the results, was that they had worse memory, they had more hyperactivity, they were more anxious, but they actually weren't afraid. So that was a good thing. They weren't afraid, but they were very, very active. And as a consequence, we are working with Yale University on the Baby Safe project. And I'd like to, uh, I hope that we'll be able to do that soon with people here in Israel as well. We're working with pediatricians and obstetricians. We have more than 200 international experts, including Dr. Hugh Taylor, who is the chairman of obstetrics and gynecology at Yale University, where they deliver about 4,000 babies a year. And every woman that walks in there can get from gets from uh, Yale University advice about how to use phones safely during pregnancy. And as I showed you before, the end is most important. Now, <clears throat> the Korean government has issued this concern because they believe that they are seeing a synergistic effect. They did a study on children, human children, and found that those kids with the highest lead levels, and by the way, the lead levels that were high were just above three micrograms per deciliter. That is, would have been considered nothing 30 years ago. It's a very, very low level. They found only that the ADHD symptoms were worsened in children who had made voice calls and had a lead level. That's a very, very important finding. And uh, again, it's consistent with some of the other concerns. I'm briefly going to show you just some of the work prenatal exposure on the hippocampus. We saw, and we'll hear again from Fiorella, 
about the effects on um, litter size and offspring. This is a study published in Brain Research showing that this damage occurs at 900 megahertz electromagnetic fields. These are very, this is the granular cells. This shows downsizing, downsizing and deterioration. Here, these are nice, healthy control cells with no evidence of damage. This is from a journal that I edited recently with Suleiman Kaplan, um, uh, and it's available online. Now, digital dementia has become a problem <coughs> diagnosed in Korea. We'll have a chance to discuss it more in detail. I don't know if it's been seen in Israel, but it's characterized by children who really are lacking the ability to leave their devices and are heavy technology users. This is not a Wi-Fi issue. This is a technology issue for the young developing brain. And there's a big debate in educational technology today about how to use this technology, when to use it, and at what ages the brain benefits most from it. We want our children to be digital citizens, but we want them to be capable of interacting with the world as well. So I'm not going to get into more detail about the Korean government. I will leave you with Martha Herbert's concerns expressed with, to the American Academy of Pediatrics, and she's on the faculty at Harvard Medical School. And she is saying here, the evidence is sufficient to warrant new public exposure standards benchmarked to low intensity non-thermal exposure levels, now known to be biologically disruptive. That is the question we have to consider here. What is the advice we should give? Interim, precautionary practices are advocated. Think of pregnant teachers in schools. Think of all of us and how we should go about doing this. Just as further evidence, something that I, those of you who are, who've ever worked in the NIC, you know, is that blue light is disruptive. And we know that because melatonin, melatonin is what we naturally make at night. Blue light, if you're on your device just before you go to bed, it, is, it disrupts the normal development of melatonin. Babies who are born with hyperbilirubinemia do not have enough dihydroxyvitamin D, and exposing them to blue light where their skin and the blood is circulating through their skin for use just a few days will allow their bodies to make enough vitamin D. So it's biologically active to have blue light in the baby. Of course, we're not babies, but we are still biologically affected, and there is actually evidence of protection of melatonin against damage. I'll just briefly mention this. If you give the, the um, animals the RF radiation plus melatonin, you get less damage than if you give them RF radiation alone. And that's another reason why you need to sleep in the dark. And finally, the honeybees. I'll just show you this. After 10 days of 10 minutes of cell phone radiation in, in hives, the hives, and this is published peer-reviewed studies, in which the cell phones were, the bees did not return as much. They did not make as much honey. Uh, they, were, uh, they were in very sad shape. So we need to ask if that can do this experimentally to the honeybees, uh, what may it be doing to us? And why do we have so many inconsistent results? Well, for one reason, it is truly complicated. Uh, for another reason, sometimes when you get different outcomes, you're looking at different cells of different ages, uh, adult cells versus uh, child cells, neuronal stem cells. And finally, sponsored research can induce publication bias. I leave you again with my quote from Albert Einstein, the world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think we'll go on to the next presentation. All right, thank you.